All right, well, let's get started with the Patreon questions, as we always do. Uh, Aditya says, West Indies of the 70s and 80s and the Australians of the 80s and 90s are the best teams in history by some margin. But who would you place just below these two teams as the best? Pakistan of the 80s and early 90s and South Africa under Grant Smith come to mind. Uh, would love to know your thoughts. Yeah, it's... I think... I was trying to find this. I saw this message come in and I tried to find a tweet I had sent and it might even be in an article, but unfortunately, uh, uh, with, the, with the test match on at the same time, doing this podcast during lunch, of course, um, I didn't quite get a chance. My memory is that I had um, South Africa ranked fourth or fifth best all time, uh, the Graham Smith South Africa. I don't think I'd have the Pakistan team quite that high, um, only because they were the second best team in their era. Um, but they're probably still in the top, what, sixth or seventh, probably, um, uh, thinking about it. Uh, I think you have to do post-World War II. Um, and I think there is a period where the Australian team and the English team of their 40s slash 50s and 50s slash 60s um, are certainly there. Um, I'm trying to remember the exact exact things, but I, I think I had um, South Africa's team around fifth. Uh, um, uh, the the Graham Smith great era team. I thought it was massively underrated at the time. Um, I think I've written a whole article about that. In fact, the, the Pakistan one I think is also underrated. They were almost as good as the West Indies for a shorter period of time, and they were obviously a fantastic team. But they never did dominate at that same level um, because uh, because of that. And you could probably put some of the other very good South African teams who ran into Australia but dominated everyone else. Um, into a similar sort of category, but they're both very, very good teams. Right. And Kennedy says, do you see this to be a potential future for T20 cricket? A year round with some holes for test cricket and other shenanigans, uh, T20 international premier league with one leg in India, others in South Africa, UAE, West Indies, Europe, uh, depending on what boards want to join up. KKR style overarching ownership structures for all of the teams, core cool group of top cricketers that consistently playing for the team. Uh, round out with local domestic players. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's kind of what's happening organically. I don't know if organically is the right way, um, uh, but that's kind of what's happening already uh, is what you're saying. So uh, the South African League, the UAE League, the West Indies League, the US League are all at this stage, um, what I would say at various stages of being feeder leagues for the IPL. Um Major League out of all of those in America, I think has the best chance just because it has such a strong market. You've included Europe in there. Obviously, Europe's a little bit different because of the UK. But yes, I think that probably makes more sense. I don't think that's what I would do, though. Like if, if you're saying what is the best thing for uh, for a system, it's probably what eight months of the year you play the IPL. I keep saying eight. It seems like a lot um, the way how slowly it's moving. But eventually, maybe in 30 years time, it's eight. Uh, but let's say six months of the year is the IPL, um, and uh, and then you have you know Major League Cricket in the in the window outside of that, and you have some of the other um, the hundred and and whatever other a CPL um, Cricket South Africa League etc. Um, so yeah, I think we're already sort of going towards that sort of thing. Um, there has to be at one stage a symmetry between all these different leagues. And that is what I don't understand. Do we have to go away from the auction IPL model towards more of a football model? Or is there more of an American sports model where you can buy Trent Bolt, but for all the leagues, you know, is there a global auction? I don't know. Um, I haven't thought about that enough until just then, Kennedy. But yes, I think your your basic idea is it, it makes a lot of sense. And that's certainly, I think, where the, it's going sort of regardless. Um, I've actually just done a video, which will probably be out next week, about T20 leagues and where they're going and everything else and the different kinds of T20 leagues we have now based on what's happened with Trent Bolt. But it's more about national cricket and everything as well. But um, it's worth, uh, it, it, whenever it comes out, Kennedy, it'll be worth having a look for you. Uh, Ian says, uh, central contracts going to wither on the vine. Trent Bolt is the headline this week, but with so many T20 leagues bringing up around the world and the pool of players needed to cover them all expanding uh, as some tournaments overlap. Isn't it inevitable that the best players will want the same freedom to play when and when they're like, yes, the best players, Ian. That doesn't necessarily mean that central contracts are going to wither and vine. So for instance, 
trying to think of a situation. Uh, um, uh, oh, um, Harry Kector. So future of Irish cricket. Chances are Ireland are not going to be able to afford Harry Tector if he continues to develop the way that I think some of us think he will. He's going to be, at the very least, a very high-end middle-tier T20 player. High-end middle-tier? I'm not sure that's a thing. But, you know, I don't think he'll ever be a top-end uh, IPL player, but perhaps he's a squad member IPL player. Certainly, you know, PSL, Big Bash, CPL, all well within his um, grasp. He's already signed up with one of them, hasn't he? Um and so, so for Ireland, there's no way they're going to be able to keep him as a centrally contracted player. He will go off and play in all these other leagues if he gets signed up by one of those big teams. But that really also means that that gives Ireland a chance to develop another player on their central league contracted ways. Now, yes, they will have Harry Tector less often, all those sorts of things. Although, to be honest, when we talk about this, we don't talk about the fact that this has been happening to associate teams, not to mention South Africa, New Zealand. West Indies for, you know, close to a hundred years. Um, so there are the, all those things that do need to be factored into this, but yeah, I think central contracts will continue, but they will have different meanings. They may be more of a development sort of thing. Uh, and, and you could also do, do something. I, I always thought the Australian Institute of Sport would pump all this money into these players. And then the players never had to do anything if they became successful. And in Australian universities, you have this thing called HEX, where you go to a university and if you get your job in that industry and you make a certain amount of money, then you pay back your, your HEX fees. And I kind of think that those sorts of ideas going forward, if you pump 50, 100, 200, 250,000 dollars into a young cricketer and they go on to be, you know, Dio Brefus or whoever, whoever it is. And, you know, Nicholas Puran, and they never play for your national team, although Nicholas Puran would dispute that any money was pumped into him. But um, is there a way that those players, when they start to earn that money, can, can do it back? I don't know how the contracts work and how all that sort of stuff, but that might be something that going ahead that everyone wants to be involved with. Because if you're an IPL franchise, you also want that, whichever talent supply you want to keep coming up with those players as well. Um, uh, you know, so I, I, I think there's a lot of, as we get more and more towards this new model, I think there's actually a lot of interesting ways that it can grow and expand. Will says, do we really have to have five test series? They almost always end up in one side of destructions of the away side who ultimately get overwhelmed while playing in unfamiliar conditions. Three tests just makes more sense in today's landscape and would be evenly spread things across the sides. Well, being that the only, there's only a couple of teams doing it and it's because you make more money from five than three. Everyone else is doing three because that means you limit your losses and they're doing two when they can, because why not? Um, yeah, I, I think that the 05 Ashes and the probably 2019 Ashes maybe, um, and, and you could throw in the Australia, um, India series of 01, um, uh, 1981 Ashes. They don't come along very often when you have a very close series, uh, the England, uh, the Australia India series was shorter, but imagine what that would have been like if it was five tests. And there's been a couple of test series between Australia and Pakistan, uh, sorry, Australia and India and Australia and South Africa. We just like, I wish these were five test series. Um, and I think the one thing I would say, Will, is that there is something about it going for six or seven weeks and it being that up and down. And even if that only happens every couple of years, I wonder how many cricket fans are born out of those series. I wonder what Headingley 81 did and, you know, Australia, India, uh, well, so Ashes 81 and Australia, India in, in 01 did, um, in those, in those kinds of, um, uh, for fans and for groups of people. I do think that that is something that five test series have as an advantage over three test series. But there's no doubt that we're going to see fewer and fewer five test series unless they make a lot of money. And that's what the FTP seems to already be suggesting. Oh, Christopher says, what are your thoughts on the FTP? Seems to me a lot of pointless white ball series. Yeah, I think everyone on <laughs> listening to this podcast is aware of my thoughts on, on bilateral one day games and T20 games in general. Um, it's more, it's more cricket. Uh, well, it's more games. I don't know if it's more days. I didn't actually check the days, but it's more games of international cricket than there was in the previous cycle, despite the fact that, I mean, you look at this, you look at the Southern Hemisphere summer. My God, what are we up to? Six um, franchise tournaments? 
how are we playing this much international cricket at the same time? I really don't understand. So that would be, I think that was the big headliner for me. It was just like, they had a chance of thinking differently and they didn't. Um, and I was a little bit, I was a little bit not, maybe not disappointed, but, um, cause I wasn't disappointed cause I expected it. I was a little bit like, oh, here's another moment where they could have done something positive. And instead they went, oh, no, we'll just put more games in. Uh, Rubov says, what on earth was the decision-making around the 100 broadcast graphics? What are your thoughts on how school stats should be presented in TV in a way that would be actually digestible to new viewers? Yeah, I think a lot of people got paid a lot of money to work with the 100. I'm trying to be careful how I word this because I was one of the people that almost made money off it. But I think there was a lot of people who were paid a lot of money to say, oh, the reason people don't watch cricket is because scores are undecipherable. I think I, I like the idea of, especially in a limited overs game, of keeping it really, really simple of, uh, of saying you need this many runs from this many balls. That's an, a step forward. And I think I might have even done this about, I might have even made a video about this last year, Rhubarb, about there are actually things from that that are obvious and that should have been done a long time ago. However, splitting them up onto two sides of the screen just seems like a gimmick for the sake of having a gimmick. Um, and there are very simple things that I personally am not a big fan of. Um, but th there is a, I think we got, I think there's been some great broadcasters and some great producers of cricket over the years. But I think with the graphics, we probably did get a little bit too, um, I think of the, the right wording here. I did. I do think we got a little bit too samey and there are better ways of showing things. And I think that, you know, what the hundred has tried to do is that, but in getting some things right, they got some things massively wrong. And you could say that about almost everything to do with the hundred. HW341 says, you've spoken before about how test cricket should be run in a league, leaving aside practicalities. Yep because it won't happen, as we both know. What do you think the ideal format for international test cricket would be? One league where everyone plays everyone. Uh, I I kind of, I think if it was me, that's probably what it would be. Um, you would have all 12 teams, and over four years, you'd have to play a home and away series against them. That is leaving us away practicalities. Then you would have Division 2 test cricket and Division 3 test cricket, and you would have a similar system there. Obviously, to go back to your practicality, there's other ways of doing it, of course, that you could have conferences. Um, I don't think you'd do regional conferences, um, but you could do, you know, uh, I don't really understand how baseball conferences work, but maybe more like baseball conferences rather than basketball conferences, um, is something else that you could do. You could also do, uh, you know, the original plan was to have seven teams in division one, seven teams in division two, uh, pro uh promotion and relegation games. I kind of like that because on top of the final, you also get, you know, let's say you get two teams go up and two teams go down and, you know, the, the team who finishes sixth has to play the team who finishes second in Division Two, um, and the seventh team plays the team who finished one in Division Two. I kind of like all those sorts of things. So now we have three test matches that I kind of feel like people are going to watch. Even I, I don't know, maybe it's just me, and I watch a lot of stuff, so maybe I'm not. But I just think three knockout games, one for the title and two for relegation, that seems kind of cool. Um, but yeah, the other way of doing it is is the all 12 teams automatically qualify for division one, but three teams go up and three teams go down or two teams go up and two teams go down. Um, uh, if we had 12 teams in one division, I think we'd then also need semifinals. Uh, I think that would be the thing I bring in. I see you've written about playoffs there. So one versus four, two versus three. I, I love the idea of one versus two, three versus four, like the IPL do, which is obviously an old Aussie rules rugby league um, style. Um, Actually, no, you said leave all practi practicalities aside. Let's do that. And let's make them all three test series. All right. Let's just have fun with it. Um, but uh, thank you for that one. Uh, Abraham says, many criticized India's decision to leave out Ashwin in England's tests in 2021. Do his poor returns in the two tests in South Africa later that year, 64 overs at 1 for 182, have indicated the decision to pick Shardul over him? No. I mean, Shardwell played well, so that vindicates it on a, on a very, you know, on a basic level. Um, I, I think that when they lost this test to England this year, 
there are things that Ashwin can do that Jadeja does not have the ability to do. And a lot of those involve keeping pressure on players early in the game. Um, it's his ability to, even when he's, even when the conditions are not in his favor, you have to watch him. And if you watch the way that England played Jadeja, and I think if you look, watch the way that England played Jadeja at times in that England series, I felt that they were just like, well, it's going to be a problem later on, but at the moment we don't have to worry about him. I think when you've got Ashwin in the team, he's a constant threat. Now, he didn't do particularly well in that South African series, but that's a different country as well. Different pitches, different environment. And I believe, and I've said this many times, the reason Ashwin doesn't do well enough overseas is because too often he hasn't played overseas. He's the best spinner in the world. He should be in their 11 for every single game. Him and Jadeja complement each other perfectly and allows you to have three frontline seam bowlers. Plus, they can bat at seven and eight. Maybe six and seven sometimes when you, you, know, you need that. I just don't understand it. Uh, I would play him all the time. Um, I think it's a mistake not to. And, you know, we were commentating for SEN uh, that India um, test match at Birmingham, wasn't it? Edge Baston, yeah. Um, and that's the whole time I was watching it, I was thinking you know, India would be better now if they had Ashwin bowling. Um, Shardul's done, I think, better than we ever thought he would do. Um, I think he could, should continue to be used in certain situations that favor what he does. But you also have to remember that he's a very limited cricketer. His batting has already started to regress to where we would have expected it to. Um, his bowling's still really good, but you, there were times when they were playing against England in that chase. And okay, England were on a roll and a lot of, you know, the softballs and all that sort of stuff. But there were times in that chase where it looked like because Siraj was bowling poorly and because Jadeja didn't really have an answer for anything, that basically it was Mohamed Shami or Jasper Brumra on their own. So they had a five man bowling attack and they were reduced to two men. I don't think you can ever do that with Ashwin in the side. I think you can with Jadeja. I think Siraj, as brilliant as he is, it does seem to have some ups and downs. And I think Shadul is a fifth bowler. So there's a natural, you know, um, uh, you know, letdown from his bowling sometime. Whereas if you have Ashwin in the side, you then have five absolutely genuine frontline bowlers. Um, and even if two of them are in bad form, you can probably control the game with Ashwin at one end and moving around your seamers at the, uh, your, your two informed seamers at the other end. Um, so no, I don't really get it. And also because you are playing three seamers, if you, you know, uh, you can, shuttle could be the third seamer in certain situations as well. Um, uh, because you're not expecting him to be frontline then. And you're really probably just expecting him to get through two really good spells in the first what, 40 overs, 50 overs, probably a five over spell, um, between what the, 12th and the 20th over, um, you know, that sort of period. Then another one, maybe around the 35th overs mark. And then you throw the ball to him at the end uh, to, you know, help the spinners out a little bit. Then you've got him in the side anyway. So um, I, I really, I, I don't understand why you wouldn't pick Ashwin. But I, I think they, and I wrote about this a decade ago, Abraham. They, made, they started making this error when he bowled brilliantly in Australia against Australia in 2011-12. Um, and they and didn't take a lot of wickets. And they just basically decided that that meant he wasn't any good. They, they, they should have spent seven years with him bowling outside of Australia in test matches. Um, he's by far the best spin bowler in the world. By a long way. <laughs> so, no. Um, uh, I see where you're coming from, but I... I I would still have him in any team. Satchmo says, women have only played 33 tests in the last 24 years. That doesn't seem a lot, does it? Even great players like Catherine Brunt have played fewer than 20 tests in her career. Forget Catherine Brunt, who's phenomenal. Susie Bates hasn't played a test. How would you ensure that women's tests are played more frequently than only one or two a year? Yeah, I think, I think now that this is the problem with this bilateral thing. It allows New Zealand, for instance, and South Africa and India to probably not play as many tests as they should. Um, with the other teams be beneath them, or oh, I don't know where West Indies fits into that as well. I really think that 
if the ICC were running things, we'd probably have a women's test championship. And I don't think it would be a lot of tests. Um, and I don't think all the teams would necessarily want to sign up for it either. But, but I think that's probably what you would need is some sort of women's test championship. Without that, I just think that, I think New Zealand cricket for what is a pretty good progressive cricket board in many different ways and have recently done something with paying their women have been absolutely, what they do with the fact that there's no women's test matches in their country and the fact they don't get the, the flack for it, they quite clearly deserve is probably partly because they don't have a proper cricket media over there. Uh, they don't have full-time uh, cricket writers putting pressure on them, but also they've just gotten away with it and they shouldn't. So you probably have to put in some sort of a series. I just, I don't understand why you can't play test ma women's test matches at smaller venues um, and make it more revenue neutral eventually i actually think it's a really good tv product women's test cricket because it still goes for four days right um and it is sellable um so i think it's a i think it's one of those things where everyone's like oh it doesn't make any money so we won't do it rather than thinking if we invest in this now we'll probably make more money in the future unfortunately that is almost all of cricket james says 1992 world cup is one of the most fondly remembered by cricket fans one thing that sticks out is the single division round robin format as opposed to the pool formats used in later tournaments given that the pool format is susceptible to creating a pool of death situation why has it stuck and the round robin not been used again i think even on the patreon comments you realized that it had been and someone had, had, had told you it came back for 2019. all right it's funny 1992 is remembered very fondly and it should be. It's the first one with coloured clothes. It's in many ways the first proper World Cup. Uh, you know, the way it was played, the way it was promoted, the way it was thought about, uh, all these different things. But there was a lot, you know, and, and, and the problem with that, the, the big round robin is you need a bit of luck with the way that the round robin goes. And when you fit more teams in, there's a lot of games that, kind of don't make that as as much um sense and then you need and if you have four really strong teams you don't have anyone else strong it's still going to do a similar thing but most importantly we want more teams in the world cup so we actually i think the 2019 kind of proved that the round robin didn't do anything special in 1992 1992 was lightning in a bottle because for many of us it was the first time we saw all the teams together at one time we didn't even see most cricket fans in 87 didn't even see that much cricket most cricket fans in in um in in the other years didn't see all the cricket like you know uh, the the great capital devs innings against zimbabwe wasn't filmed unless bbc had a news camera but I, I can't even remember if they did right so by 92 it's really it's so it's pumped up because of that i don't think the round robin format was any more spectacular than anything else um i've got no problem with pool of death situations that's what tournament sport is about you know, you are supposed to be the best team if you're to win the tournament. And if you're not, then go home. I don't think you should get to just play everyone. Um, uh, so I don't, I don't care about that. I just want more teams and for the tournament to be run better, um, if we're being honest. Oh, that's it. That's Patreon. All done. All right. So if anyone has any questions in the room, um, feel free to put up your hand. I know it's a, I know it's a, uh, what do you call it? A test match. So you've got a couple of minutes if anyone wants to um, uh, put their hands up for anything at the moment. Just making sure I sent the tweet out to tell everyone to come to the room. Uh, I'll send it again. Uh, but yeah, if you have, have a question, put it up in the room. But thanks again to the Patreon supporters. Um, uh, obviously, you know, uh, Patreon is the reason that this podcast exists. So that's why they get to ask the questions first. And to be honest, the level of questions uh, from Patreon is outstanding. Uh, in, even in the room, it's quite good as well. But if you have a question, put your hand up like Ashish has. You there, mate? Ashish, I've got a picture of you in the snow. Not so much a snow angel, more just laying there. Perhaps with a lady friend. Ashish? not all right i'll just remove you as a speaker for a moment um uh, while anyone else or ashish wants to come back in ask a question just put your hand up uh what have i i'm just trying to think of what i've got coming up oh for, for those who don't know we've got 
a bunch of podcasts in the 99.94 network at the moment. So we just launched the uh, South African podcast with Lungani Zama and uh, Neil Manthorpe. Uh, really excited to have them on. I don't think they've recorded their first episode yet, but they've recorded the intro episode with me, which was fun. Um, except Zam's disappeared at one stage. He actually disappeared twice. His microphone kicked him out of the room at one stage and another stage he um, um, he had low sh- um, shedding, uh, which means power cuts, and uh, suddenly we couldn't see him. Uh, but he, he stayed on the broadcast for that one. Uh, so we've had him. We just had uh, Dan Norcross and Rory Dollard sign up for the English one, so they must be about two or three episodes in now. Um, you know, hugely... I th- I don't know if I've listened to one of their podcasts yet. Uh, the India 99.94 podcast is also um, uh, going quite strong. So Nikesh um, Raghani and Asara Waris are, I don't think how many episodes they must be in. They must have done about four or five. Really enjoying that. I was listening to the one about the Zimbabwe tour today, which I thought was a really, really good um, episode. I probably listened to about the first 10 minutes of that before people kept calling me up and annoying me. Um, uh, what, and what else have we got? Oh, of course we got, uh, you know, the OG, uh, the West Indies podcast with, um, uh, um, Michelle and Santoki from the Caribbean cricket podcast. Uh, they, I mean, they are obviously, you know, I've all my, everyone else I've sort of jammed together and everyone's learning to work with each other and doing quite a good job. But those two, you know, basically taking what they do already and just tweaking it a little bit uh, for, for what we need. They're, you know, if you have any interest in West Indies cricket, their podcast is fantastic. Both of their podcasts, our one and the non-our one. Um, uh, but, they're, you know, they're, they've been great. We'll also in the future be looking at doing um, uh, chats like this, these Spotify Lives. Uh, was it, It's called Spotify Live now? I forgot what the app's called. Um, going forward with some of these hosts as well. Um, so you can, you know, if you have your specific West Indies question or South Africa or wherever, the next podcast is the Sri Lankan one, and then we'll do the double century. And then we sort of regroup, uh, get some more funding, uh, and work out what our next step is. But I've got a pretty good idea of what most of my international podcasts are going to be, um, with some specialty podcasts thrown in as well. Um, and of recent times, we've had a few people, uh, you know, a few really interesting podcasting people get in touch with us as well. So, um, yeah, a huge thanks. Any, anyone who supports us on Patreon, but just if by listening to the Red Inca podcast, you've kind of made this available, made this possible because we needed a proof of concept. And, you know, for them to be able to see the, the, the amount of listeners and the engagement that we get on these podcasts means that, you know, we know uh, what, what we're doing, hopefully, um, but also allows us to really... Um, uh, really boost, um, you know, the, the other podcasts as well. And, and they really are great. I mean, you know, I don't want to suck up to these people too much. Well, hopefully they won't listen to my podcast, but you know, Neil Manthorpe and Daniel Norcross are absolutely incredible broadcasters. Nikesh Raghani is very underrated. Sarah Waris, I think, you know, Wisdom have finally worked out who she is, but I've been following her for a few years, wondering why she hasn't got bigger breaks. Rory Dollard is, you know, I, I'm going to call him an uncut gem, partly because I think it would bother him. Um, but, you know, Rory's incredible. You know, Zams is incredible as well. You know, all these different people that we've been able to put together. Obviously, the Caribbean Cricket Podcast, I think, has changed the way that we talk about West Indies cricket because of how detailed it is, um, how much information you can get on West Indies cricket, and then having them on the West Indies podcast. And Michelle is obviously, you know, a brilliant um, a broadcaster and, and still developing as a broadcaster as well. And um, Santoki is a great writer, and occasionally Michelle lets him talk, which I really enjoy. Um, but yeah, uh, you know, thanks to everyone who's, who's really helped with this, but it's been, it's been going, uh, quite well, but if you do have any questions in the room, oh, it's just back. Sorry. Sitting here talking to myself, but yeah, put your hand up or you can ask them. I think in, what's the other way you can ask them in, um, text form as well, but Ashish, are you there? We're having one of those days, aren't we? Ashish, if you want, you can write your one in the, in the chat. And I can read it out for you, but if anyone else ha- um, has anything. Um, but I've got a great video coming up shortly on Bradman, which is based on, I, I can't remember if it was a Patreon question or if it was a question on one of these podcasts, but um, and a bit like Aditya's one today, like 
you, you can have the ability where I will take one of your questions and make it into a video. Um, so someone asked about Bradman and about how he would go in modern cricket if you kind of just time traveled him. And I got very, very into the idea, you know, talked about it on the original podcast episode. It must be about a month or two back on, on wagon wheel now. And I finally had a chance to make a, um, a video about it and it's, it's gone really, really well. Um, you know, huge fan of, um, uh, of, of that kind of weirdness and being able to use it. Ron Burt. Ron Burt, are you there? Hello, yes, I am. Can you hear me? I can. What's your question, mate? Oh, can I say one thing quickly about Neil Manthorpe before we start, which is positive, I promise. Um, I've always... Uh, even if it's negative, you could say it. <laughs> um, I've always had massive respect for Neil for kind of writing sort of mayor culpa's hands up about Hansi Cronje, which I, I'm sure not every journalist in his position would have done. And I'm never going to get to say it to him, so if you want to pass that on, that would be lovely. I would definitely not say it to him. I, I try not to say anything nice to him. Unless I have to. <laughs> um, and I've probably got a very simple question compared to, to some of the, the much better ones that, that you've had already. But I was just wondering, are there any particular things you see or hear still in commentary, especially on T20s, those kind of um, classic tropes that are just not proven by data? And do they make you throw things at the screen if they still happen? Yeah, I think the, the, the one that gets used the most is, uh, oh, it's clever batting. He's hit a single, the ball after hitting a boundary. I think for anyone who's worked in analysis of T20 cricket, it is, it's a punch in the throat every time we hear that. Because if you think about it, I think what T20 cricket does probably more than any other format is it reverses who the attackers and who the defenders are. So in test cricket, you know, the attackers are having, you know, bowlers with the, with the batter scoring and surviving. And in T20 cricket, once you have a good matchup, why on earth, and you have the ability to hit them for a boundary, why would you, the next ball, just turn it for a single? And it's very old-fashioned cricket. It's not even a one-day cricket thing. It sort of predates one-day cricket. The idea that, oh, you've hit a boundary. Yeah, I, I had a friend who was a brilliant cricketer and just didn't quite make it to first-class cricket, but, you know, was certainly a first-class cricket-level talent. And you would watch him bat, and the first ball of every boundary, uh, first ball of every over, he'd hit a boundary. The second ball, he'd hit a single. Then he'd stay on his bat for the next four balls. And then the next over, he'd do the same thing, and he'd do it over and over and over again. And he was absolutely brilliant at that. And so from a test match cricket perspective, it's great. You've, you've, you've unsettled the bowler straight away, and now you're at the other end and he can't get you out, and you've already kept the scoring rate ticking over perfectly. From a T20 perspective, if I have the ability to line up a bowler and hit a boundary off them, and it's a bowler that I have a good matchup against and I've, and I've got maybe a good boundary or I've got the wind in my favor or whatever it may be. Why on earth would I want to give that up? So I think that's probably the biggest one. Um, the other one is they talk about how many slow balls are bowled and the data doesn't back that up. And to be honest, I, I mean, I've talked to um, Simon Dool about this a little bit and, you know, Dwayne Bravo is maybe the, the best example of this. When we look at his numbers, he bowls about, 30% slower balls, I think, or 20% slower balls, might even be less than that. Um, and in general, you know, you hear, ah, oh, everyone bowls, slow, oh, bowls all these slower balls. Another, oh, actually, I'm going to add an extra one about slower balls. This is my personal bugbear, and I do think that people will work this out. But <laughs> well, I was, since you've said something nice about Neil Manthorpe, I would do the opposite now. So Neil Manthorpe was commentating with me and Jay Dernbach recently. Uh, I can't remember what series we were commentating on. And he was saying, oh, but Jade, you had all these different slow balls. And Jade sort of looked at him with that sort of puzzled face. And I was like, Manners, Jade Dermak had one slow ball. He had the back of the hand slow ball. He very occasionally bowled the cutter. And I think you hear this all the time. I think it would be really good if we started talking about what kind of slow balls someone had. Someone might bowl 50% of their deliveries as slow balls, but chances are they're all going to be like one kind of slow ball. So again, I'd love, and, and most commentators can pick them. You don't always get them exactly right. And, you know, in the heat of the moment, you're not always concentrating and, and you don't always have, um, you know, the cameras are slightly s further away at times, if that makes sense, and all those sorts of things. Uh, those are the ones, I suppose, in T20 cricket that bother me the most. I'm just trying to think if there's anything else. You know, there's still a lot of talk about anchors, isn't there? Um, 
Uh, although I think it's almost flipped the other way now that so many commentators, especially in the IPL, seem to be having a go at anyone who's not scoring at two runs a ball all the time. Um, but yeah, I think those are the ones uh, that certainly, that probably for me, um, come up the most. But thanks so much for your question, mate. All right, I think they'll be going back out uh, to play so, so shortly. But let's get Ashish, who finally had a problem. He's lost his microphone, but he's found his keypad. Um, he's asking, why do we rarely see a spin bowling quartet in Asia, but quite frequently see four seamers in a bowling lineup in seam friendly nation? Is it because the paces have reverse swing in Asia and spinners don't have that kind of advantage outside of Asia? No, the reason you don't see as many quartets is because you need four. Let's okay. It's <laughs> a good question. Um, because essentially you need to rest fast bowlers. So let's say you have a green pitch and you're like, we're not going to bowl our spinner in this game, right? Um, we, we now need to make sure that we can rest our fast bowlers. Now, you might do that through a spinner traditionally, but if you don't have that, you need that extra spinner. If you're playing on a spin-friendly pitch in Asia, three um, seamers, uh, sorry, three spinners is probably enough to bowl you almost all the way through a test. Like, Murali would bowl all day from one end. Shane Warne would do similar things. You know, Anil Kumble, uh, Rangana Harath, Ashwin has done it, right? So I remember watching some, have a look at some of the bowling attacks when I'm trying to think, was it Jadeja, Aksha, and Ashwin were all bowling together? It was actually hard to fit in the bowlers around Ashwin at times. Um, I'm sure, was there a test in India where Washington Sundar played as well, where I don't think they could work out how to, maybe I'm getting that one confused, but there's been a couple of times when I've seen India go in with three spinners and you're like, how do you kind of fit all these bowlers into the attack? Because once Ashwin finds his groove, he's going to bowl forever. Jadeja can bowl forever. Um, Akshar could probably bowl forever as well. It's not the same. So you expect a spinner to bowl a 10 or 12 over spell. Whereas for a seam bowler, you expect six overs. The other thing that you mentioned there is that on seam friendly pitches, you are not expecting the game to go very deep, right? So you're not expecting the game to go to the full five days. So part of the reason you're not picking a spinner is most spinners in seam friendly conditions are only going to come into the game around the fourth or fifth day, right? Unless the pitch does something extraordinary early on or, that t or it seems and it spins or whatever that may be, right? Whereas on, on a spin friendly wicket, you probably still want to, you, you want your, you still want to exploit the new ball a little bit with, with seam bowling, even if it's just one seam bowl. Um, and then as you said, reverse swing is important, but also you don't want, you want to have a, that little bit of variety, um, available to you as far as you know, short balls and, and other things. There are things that fast bowling and seam bowling does that obviously spin bowling cannot replicate. And I think that in those situations is probably seen as a more valuable skill to have one seam or two seamers in your team available to do that to you rather than we spin on a seam friendly track. We just like, it's not that we don't value spin. We just don't think we're going to bowl our spinner on this wicket at all. Um, they don't need to exploit the new ball. There will be no reverse swing for them. And we don't need them to bowl bounces at anyone or fast at anyone. And so I think it's probably that. I think it's also just cricket's innate um, uh, pattern, right? The three seamers, uh, one spinner pattern that has come from English, Australian, South African. They're the first three test nations, right? That sort of pattern is certainly been around with us for a very long time, but I do think it is very much to do with the way that those other bowlers inter the way that spinners, um, can bowl longer spells, the way that the conditions, uh, play, but that's a, a great question, Ashish. And I wish that I'd heard your voice say it, but I didn't anyway. Um, again, great questions from everyone really enjoyed the chat. Uh, we'll be around next week. Uh, when the tests are on, um, I try and put them on during the lunch break. I, I gives you something to listen to during the lunch break um, if you don't want to listen to the main broadcast. Um, and also it's, uh, you know, when I'm not working. So thank you very much. And I'll see you again on the next podcast. <laughs>